4.3 protein tertiary and quaternary structures. The overall three-dimensional arrangement of all atoms in a protein is referred to as the protein's tertiary structure. Whereas the term secondary structure refers to the spatial arrangement of amino acid residues that are adjacent in a segment of a polypeptide, tertiary structure includes longer. Range aspects of amino acid sequence. Amino acids that are far apart in the polypeptide sequence and are in different types of secondary structure may interact within the completely folded structure of a protein. The location of bends, including beta turns, in the polypeptide chain and the direction and angle of these bends are determined by the number and location of specific bend producing residues, such as PRO, THR, SER, and GLY. Interacting segments of polypeptide chains are held in their characteristic tertiary positions by several kinds of weak interactions, and sometimes by covalent bonds such as disulfide crosslinks between the segments. Some proteins contain two or more separate polypeptide chains or subunits, which may be identical or different. The arrangement of these protein subunits in three-dimensional complexes constitutes quaternary structure. In considering these higher levels of structure, it is useful to designate two major groups into which many proteins can be classified, fibrous. Proteins, with polypeptide chains arranged in long strands or sheets, and globular proteins, with polypeptide chains folded into a spherical or globular shape. The two groups are structurally distinct. Fibrous proteins usually consist largely of a single type of secondary structure, and their tertiary structure is relatively simple. Globular proteins often contain several types of secondary structure. The two groups also differ functionally, the structures that provide support, shape, and external protection to vertebrates are made of fibrous proteins, whereas most enzymes and regulatory proteins are globular proteins. Fibrous proteins are adapted for a structural function. Alpha keratin, collagen, and silk fibroin nicely illustrate the relationship between protein structure and biological function, table 4 to 3. Fibrous proteins share properties that give strength and or flexibility to the structures in which they occur. In each case, the fundamental structural unit is a simple repeating. Element of secondary structure. All fibrous proteins are insoluble in water a property conferred by a high concentration of hydrophobic amino acid residues both in the interior of the protein and on its surface. These hydrophobic surfaces are largely buried, as many similar polypeptide chains are packed together to form elaborate supramolecular complexes. The underlying structural simplicity of fibrous proteins makes them particularly useful for illustrating some of the fundamental principles of protein structure discussed above. Table 4 to 3 of some fibrous Structure character alpha he tough in alpha carrot beta conformation soft collagen alpha keratin the alpha keratins have evolved for strength. Found only in mammals, these proteins constitute almost the entire dry weight of hair, wool, nails, claws, quills, horns, hooves, and much of the outer layer of skin. The alpha keratins are part of a broader family of proteins called intermediate filament if proteins. Other if proteins are found in the cytoskeletons of animal cells. All if proteins have a structural function and share the structural features exemplified by the alpha keratins. The alpha keratin helix is a right handed alpha helix, the same helix found in many other proteins. Francis Crick and Linus Pauling, in the early 1950s, independently suggested that the alpha helices of keratin were arranged as a coiled coil. Two strands of alpha keratin, oriented in parallel, with their amino termini at the same end, are wrapped about each other to form a supertwisted coiled coil. The supertwisting amplifies the strength of the overall structure, just as strands are twisted to make a strong rope, fig, 4 to 11. The twisting of the axis of an alpha helix to form a coiled coil explains the discrepancy between the 5.4a per turn predicted for an alpha helix by Pauling and Corey, and the 5.15 to 5.2 a repeating structure observed in the X-ray diffraction of hair, p. 152. The helical path of the supertwists is left-handed, opposite in sense to the alpha helix. The surfaces where the two alpha helices touch are made up of hydrophobic amino acid residues, 
there are groups meshed together in a regular interlocking pattern. This permits a close packing of the polypeptide chains within the left-handed supertwist. Not surprisingly, alpha-keratin is rich in the hydrophobic residues ala, val, lu, al, met, and phi. An individual polypeptide in the alpha-keratin coiled coil has a relatively simple tertiary structure, dominated by an alpha-helical secondary structure with its helical axis twisted in a left-handed superhelix. The intertwining of the two alpha-helical polypeptides is an example of quaternary structure. Coiled coils of this type are common structural elements in filamentous proteins and in the muscle protein myosin, see Fig. 5 to 27. The quaternary structure of alpha keratin can be quite complex. Many coiled coils can be assembled into large supramolecular complexes, such as the arrangement of alpha keratin that forms the intermediate filament of hair, Fig. 4 11b. The strength of fibrous proteins is enhanced by covalent crosslinks between polypeptide chains in the multi-helical ropes and between adjacent chains in a supramolecular assembly. In alpha keratins, the cross-link stabilizing quaternary structure are disulfide bonds, box 4 to 2. In the hardest and toughest alpha keratins, such as those of rhinoceros horn, up to 18% of the residues are cysteines involved in disulfide bonds. Figure 4 to 11 structure of hair. A. Hair alpha keratin is an elongated alpha. Various substructures. Box 4 to 2 permanent waving is biochemical. Engineering. When hair is exposed to moist heat, it can be stretched. At the molecular level, the alpha helices in the alpha keratin of hair are stretched out until they arrive at the fully extended beta conformation. On cooling, they spontaneously revert to the alpha helix conformation. The characteristic stretchability of alpha keratins, as well as their numerous disulfide cross linkages, is the basis of permanent waving. The hair to be waved or curled is first bent around a form of appropriate shape. A solution of a reducing agent, usually a compound containing a thiol or sulfhydryl group SH, is then applied with heat. The reducing agent cleaves the cross linkages by reducing each disulfide bond to form two cis residues. The moist heat breaks hydrogen bonds and causes the alpha helical structure of the polypeptide chains to uncoil. After a time, the reducing solution is removed, and an oxidizing agent is added to establish new disulfide bonds. Between pairs of cis residues of adjacent polypeptide chains, but not the same pairs as before the treatment. After the hair is washed and cooled, the polypeptide chains revert to their alpha helix conformation. The hair fibers now curl in the desired fashion because the new disulfide cross linkages exert some torsion or twist on the bundles of alpha helical coils in the hair fibers. The same process can be used to straighten hair that is naturally curly. A permanent wave or hair straightening is not truly permanent however because hair grows, in the new hair replacing the old, the alpha keratin has the natural pattern of disulfide bonds. Collagen like the alpha keratins, collagen has evolved to provide strength. It is found in connective tissue such as tendons, cartilage, the organic matrix of bone, and the cornea of the eye. The collagen helix is a unique secondary structure, quite distinct from the alpha helix. It is left-handed and has three amino acid residues per turn, fig. 4 to 12, and table 4 to 1. Collagen is also a coiled coil, but one with distinct tertiary and quaternary structures, three separate polypeptides, called alpha chains, not to be confused with alpha helices, are supertwisted about each other. The superhelical twisting is right-handed in collagen, opposite in sense to the left-handed helix of the alpha chains. There are many types of vertebrate collagen. Typically they contain about 35% GLY, 11% ALA, and 21% PRO and 4 HIP, for hydroxyproline, an uncommon amino acid, see Fig. 3-8A. The food product gelatin is derived from collagen. It has little nutritional value as a protein because collagen is extremely low in many amino acids that are essential in the human diet. The unusual amino acid content of collagen is related to structural constraints unique to the collagen helix. 
The amino acid sequence in collagen is generally a repeating tripeptide unit, GLY, XY, where X is often pro, and Y is often for hip. Only GLY residues can be accommodated at the very tight junctions between the individual alpha chains, FIG, 4-12B. The pro and 4-hip residues permit the sharp twisting of the collagen helix. The amino acid sequence and the supertwisted quaternary structure of collagen allow a very close packing of its three polypeptides. For hydroxyproline has a special role in the structure of collagen and in human history, box 4 to 3. Figure 4 to 3. Box 4 to 3 Medicine Y Sailors, Explorers, and College Students should eat their fresh fruits and vegetables. From this misfortune, together with the unhealthiness of the country, where there never falls a drop of rain, we were stricken with the camp sickness, which was such that the flesh of our limbs all shriveled up, and the skin of our legs became all blotched with black, moldy patches, like an old jackboot, and proud flesh came upon the gums of those of us who had the sickness, and none escaped from this sickness save through the jaws of death. The signal was this, when the nose began to bleed, then death was at hand. The Memoirs of the Lord of Join Vili, CA 1300 Asterisk. This excerpt describes the plight of Louis Ix's army toward the end of the Seventh Crusade, 1248 to 1254, when the scurvy weakened Crusader army was destroyed by the Egyptians. What was the nature of the malady afflicting these 13th century soldiers? Scurvy is caused by lack of vitamin C or ascorbic acid, ascorbate. Vitamin C is required for, among other things, the hydroxylation of proline and lysine in collagen. Scurvy is a deficiency disease characterized by general degeneration of connective tissue. Manifestations of advanced scurvy include numerous small hemorrhages caused by fragile blood vessels, tooth loss, poor wound healing, and the reopening of old wounds, bone pain and degeneration, and eventually heart failure. Milder cases of vitamin C deficiency are accompanied by fatigue, irritability, and an increased severity of respiratory tract infections. Most animals make large amounts of vitamin C, converting glucose to ascorbate in four enzymatic steps. But in the course of evolution, humans and some other animals Gorillas, guinea pigs, and fruit bats have lost the last enzyme in this pathway and must obtain ascorbate in their diet. Vitamin C is available in a wide range of fruits and vegetables. Until 1800, however, it was often absent in the dried foods and other food supplies stored for winter or for extended travel. Scurvy was recorded by the Egyptians in 1500 BCE, and it is described in the 5th century BCE writings of Hippocrates. Yet it did not come to wide public notice until the European voyages of discovery from 1500 to 1800. The first circumnavigation of the globe, 1519 to 1522, led by Ferdinand Magellan, was accomplished only with the loss of more than 80% of his crew to scurvy. During Jacques Cartier's second voyage to explore the St. Lawrence River, 1535 to 1536, his band was threatened with Complete disaster until the Native Americans taught the men to make a cedar tea that cured and prevented scurvy, it contained vitamin C. Winter outbreaks of scurvy in Europe were gradually eliminated in the 19th century as the cultivation of the potato, introduced from South America, became widespread. In 1747, James Lind, a Scottish surgeon in the Royal Navy, carried out the first controlled clinical study in recorded history. During an extended voyage on the 50-gun warship HMS Salisbury, Lynn selected 12 sailors suffering from scurvy and separated them into groups of two. All 12 received the same diet, except that each group was given a different remedy for scurvy from among those recommended at the time. The sailors given lemons and oranges recovered and returned to duty. The sailors given boiled apple juice improved slightly. The remainder continued to deteriorate. Lynn's treatise on the scurvy was published in 1753, but inaction persisted in the Royal Navy for another 40 years. In 1795, the British Admiralty finally mandated a ration of concentrated lime or lemon juice for all British sailors, hence the name Limeys. Scurvy continued to be a problem in some other parts of the world until 1932, 
when Hungarian scientist Albert St. Georgi and W. A. Wan C. G. King at the University of Pittsburgh isolated and synthesized ascorbic acid. James Lind, 1716. L. Ascorbic acid, vitamin C, is a white, odorless, crystalline powder. It is freely soluble in water and relatively insoluble in organic solvents. In a dry state, away from light, it is stable for a considerable length of time. The appropriate daily intake of this vitamin is still in dispute. The recommended value in the United States is 90 mg for men, 75 mg for women. The United Kingdom recommends 40 mg, Australia 45 mg, and Russia 50 to 100 mg, along with citrus fruits and almost all other fresh fruits. Good sources of vitamin C include peppers, tomatoes, potatoes, and broccoli. The vitamin C of fruits and vegetables is destroyed by overcooking or prolonged storage. So why is ascorbate so necessary to good health? Of particular interest to us here is its role in the formation of collagen. As noted in the text, collagen is constructed of the repeating tripeptide unit GLY, XY, where X and Y are generally pro or for hip the proline derivative for RL. Hydroxyproline, which plays an essential role in the folding of collagen and in maintaining its structure. The proline ring is normally found as a mixture of two puckered conformations, called C gamma endo and C gamma exo fig. 1. The collagen helix structure requires the pro slash 4 hip residue in the Y positions to be in the C gamma exo conformation, and it is this conformation that is enforced by the hydroxyl substitution at C4 and 4 hip. The collagen structure also requires that the pro slash 4 hip residue in the X positions have the C gamma endo conformation, and introduction of 4 hip here can destabilize the helix. In the absence of vitamin C, cells cannot hydroxylate the pro at the Y positions. This leads to collagen instability and the connective tissue problems seen in scurvy. Figure 1 The, the hydroxylation of specific pro residues in pro collagen, the precursor of collagen, requires the action of the enzyme prolyl 4 hydroxylase. This enzyme, Mr. 240,000, is an alpha 2 beta 2 tetramer in all vertebrates. The proline hydroxylating activity is found in the alpha subunits. Each alpha subunit contains one atom of non-heme iron, Fe2+, and the enzyme is one of a class of hydroxylases that require alpha ketoglutarate in their reactions. In the normal prolyl 4 hydroxylase reaction, Fig. 2A, one molecule of alpha ketoglutarate and one of O2 bind to the enzyme. The alpha ketoglutarate is oxidatively decarboxylated to form CO2 and succinate. The remaining oxygen atom is then used to hydroxylate an appropriate pro residue and pro collagen. No ascorbate is needed in this reaction. However, prolyl 4 hydroxylase also catalyzes an oxidative decarboxylation of alpha ketoglutarate that is not coupled to proline hydroxylation, Fig. 2B. During this reaction, the heme Fe2 plus becomes oxidized, inactivating the enzyme and preventing the proline hydroxylation. The ascorbate consumed in the reaction is needed to restore enzyme activity by reducing the heme iron. Scurvy remains a problem today not only in remote regions where nutritious food is scarce, but, surprisingly, on U.S. college campuses. The only vegetables consumed by some students are those in tossed salads, and days go by without these young adults consuming fruit. A 1998 study of 230 students at Arizona State University revealed that 10% had serious vitamin C deficiencies, and two students had vitamin C levels so low that they probably had scurvy. Only half the students in the study consumed the recommended daily allowance of vitamin C. Eat your fresh fruits and vegetables. Figure 2 reactions catalyzed by prolyl 4 hydroxylase. Asterisk. The tight wrapping of the alpha chains in the collagen triple helix provides tensile strength greater than that of a steel wire of equal cross section. Collagen fibrils, fig, 4 to 13 are supramolecular assemblies consisting of triple helical collagen molecules, sometimes referred to as tropocollagen molecules, associated in a variety of ways to provide different degrees of tensile strength. 
The alpha chains of collagen molecules and the collagen molecules of fibrils are cross-linked by unusual types of covalent bonds involving lys, hylis, 5-hydroxylysine, C-fig, 3-8A or his residues that are present at a few of the X and Y positions. These links create uncommon amino acid residues, such as dehydrohydroxylysinone or lysine. The increasingly rigid and brittle character of aging connective tissue results from accumulated covalent crosslinks in collagen fibrils. A typical mammal has more than 30 structural variants of collagen, particular to certain tissues, and each somewhat different in sequence and function. Some human genetic defects in collagen structure illustrate the close relationship between amino acid sequence and three-dimensional structure in this protein. Osteogenesis imperfecta is characterized by abnormal bone formation in babies, at least eight variants of this condition, with different degrees of severity, occur in the human population. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is characterized by loose joints, and at least six variants occur in humans. The composer Niccolo Paganini (1782–1840) was famed for his seemingly impossible dexterity in playing the violin. He suffered from a variant of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome that rendered him effectively double-jointed. In both disorders, some variants can be lethal, whereas others cause lifelong problems. Figure 4 to 3. All of the variants of both conditions result from the substitution of an amino acid residue with a larger R group, such as cis or ser, for a single GLY residue in an alpha chain in one or another of the collagen proteins, a different GLY residue in each disorder. These single residue substitutions have a catastrophic effect on collagen function because they disrupt the GLY, X, Y repeat that gives collagen its unique helical structure. Given its role in the collagen triple helix, Fig, 4 to 12, GLY cannot be replaced by another amino acid residue without substantial deleterious effects on collagen structure. Silk fibroin fibroin, the protein of silk, is produced by insects and spiders. Its polypeptide chains are predominantly in the beta conformation. Fibroin is rich in ALA and GLY residues, permitting a close packing of beta sheets and an interlocking arrangement of our groups, FIG, 4 to 14. The overall structure is stabilized by extensive hydrogen bonding between all peptide linkages in the polypeptides of each beta sheet and by the optimization of van der Waals interactions between sheets. Silk does not stretch because the beta conformation is already highly extended, fig, 4 to 6. However, the structure is flexible because the sheets are held together by numerous weak interactions rather than by covalent bonds such as the disulfide bonds and alpha keratins. Structural diversity reflects functional diversity in globular proteins. In a globular protein, different segments of the polypeptide chain or multiple polypeptide chains, fold back on each other, generating a more compact shape than is seen in the fibrous proteins, FIG, 4 to 15. The folding also provides the structural diversity necessary for proteins to carry out a wide array of biological functions. Globular proteins include enzymes, transport proteins, motor proteins, regulatory proteins, immunoglobulins, and proteins with many other functions. Figure 4 to our discussion of globular proteins begins with the principles gleaned from the first protein structures to be elucidated. This is followed by a detailed description of protein substructure and comparative categorization. Such discussions are possible only because of the vast amount of information available on the internet from publicly accessible databases, particularly the Protein Data Bank, Box 4-4. Figure 4-5 four Myoglobin provided early clues about the complexity of globular protein structure. The first breakthrough in understanding the three-dimensional structure of a globular protein came from X-ray diffraction studies of myoglobin carried out by John Kendrew and his colleagues in the 1950s. Myoglobin is a relatively small, Mr. 16,700, oxygen-binding protein of muscle cells. It functions both to store oxygen and to facilitate oxygen diffusion in rapidly contracting muscle tissue. Myoglobin contains a single polypeptide chain of 153 amino acid residues of known sequence and a single iron protoporphyrin, or heme, group. The same heme group that is found in myoglobin is found in hemoglobin, 
the oxygen-binding protein of erythrocytes, and is responsible for the deep red-brown color of both myoglobin and hemoglobin. Myoglobin is particularly abundant in the muscles of diving mammals such as whales, seals, and porpoises, so abundant that the muscles of these animals are brown. Storage and distribution of oxygen by muscle myoglobin permits. Diving mammals to remain submerged for long periods. The activities of Myoglobin and other globin molecules are investigated in greater detail in Chapter 5. Box 4 to for the protein data bank. The number of known three-dimensional protein structures is now more than 100,000 and doubles every couple of years. This wealth of information is revolutionizing our understanding of protein structure, the relation of structure to function, and the evolutionary paths by which proteins arrived at their present state, which can be seen in the family resemblances that come to light as protein databases are sifted and sorted. One of the most important resources available to biochemists is the Protein Data Bank, PDB, www.pdb.org. The PDB is an archive of experimentally determined three-dimensional structures of biological macromolecules containing virtually all of the macromolecular structures, proteins, RNAs, DNAs, etc., elucidated to date. Each structure is assigned an identifying label, a four-character identifier called the PDB ID. Such labels are provided in the figure legends for every PDB-derived structure illustrated in this text so that Students and instructors can explore the same structures on their own. The data files in the PDB describe the spatial coordinates of each atom for which the position has been determined. Many of the catalog structures are not complete. Additional data files provide information on how the structure was determined and its accuracy. The atomic coordinates can be converted into an image of the macromolecule by using structure visualization software. Students are encouraged to access the PDB and explore structures using visualization software linked to the database. Macromolecular structure files can also be downloaded and explored on the desktop using free software such as JSMALL. Figure 4 to 16 shows several structural representations of myoglobin, illustrating how the polypeptide chain is folded in three dimensions its tertiary structure. The red group surrounded by protein is heme. The backbone of the myoglobin molecule consists of eight relatively straight segments of alpha helix interrupted by bends, some of which are beta turns. The longest alpha helix has 23 amino acid residues and the shortest only seven, all helices are right-handed. More than 70% of the residues in myoglobin are in these alpha helical regions. X-ray analysis has revealed the precise position of each of the our groups, which fill up nearly all the space within the folded chain that is not occupied by backbone atoms. Many important conclusions were drawn from the structure of myoglobin. The positioning of amino acid side chains reflects a structure that is largely stabilized by the hydrophobic effect. Most of the hydrophobic R groups are in the interior of the molecule, hidden from exposure to water. All but two of the polar R groups are located on the outer surface of the molecule, and all are hydrated. The myoglobin molecule is so compact that its interior has room for only four molecules of water. This dense hydrophobic core is typical of globular proteins. The fraction of space occupied by atoms in an organic liquid is 0.4 to 0.6. In a globular protein the fraction is about 0.75, comparable to that in a crystal, in a typical crystal the fraction is 0.70 to 0.78, near the theoretical maximum. In this pact, environment, weak interactions strengthen and reinforce each other. 4. Example, the nonpolar side chains in the core are so close together that short-range van der Waals interactions make a significant contribution to stabilizing hydrophobic interactions. Figure 4. Deduction of the structure of myoglobin confirmed some expectations and introduced some new elements of secondary structure. As predicted by Pauling and Corey, all the peptide bonds are in the planar trans configuration. The alpha helices in myoglobin provided the first direct experimental evidence for the existence of this type of secondary structure. Three of the four pro-residues are found at bends. 
The fourth pro residue occurs within an alpha helix, where it creates a kink necessary for tight helix packing. The flatine group rests in a crevice or pocket in the myoglobin molecule. The iron atom in the center of the heme group has two bonding coordination positions perpendicular to the plane of the heme, fig, 4 to 17. One of these is bound to the R group of the His residue at position 93, the other is the site at which an O2 molecule binds. Within this pocket, the accessibility of the heme group to solvent is highly restricted. This is important for function because free heme groups in an oxygenated solution are rapidly oxidized from the ferrous, Fe2 plus, form, which is active in the reversible binding of O2, to the ferric, Fe3 plus, form, which does not bind O2. As myoglobin structures from many different species were resolved, investigators were able to observe the structural changes that accompany the binding of oxygen or other molecules and thus, for the first time, to understand the correlation between protein structure and function. Hundreds of proteins have now been subjected to similar analysis. Today, nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR, spectroscopy and other techniques supplement X-ray diffraction data, providing more information on a protein structure, box 4 to 5. In addition, the sequencing of the genomic DNA of many organisms, chapter 9, has identified thousands of genes that encode proteins of known sequence but, as yet, unknown function. This work continues apace. Figure 4. Heme consists. Table 4 to 4 approximate. And beta chain protein. Residues. Globular proteins have a variety of tertiary structures. From what we now know about the tertiary structures of thousands of globular proteins, it is clear that myoglobin illustrates just one of many ways in which a polypeptide chain can fold. Table 4 to 4 shows the proportions of alpha helix and beta conformations, expressed as percentage of residues in each type, in several small, single-chain, globular proteins. Each of these proteins has a distinct structure, adapted for its particular biological function, but together they share several important properties with myoglobin. Each is folded compactly, and in each case the hydrophobic amino acid side chains are oriented toward the interior, away from water, and the hydrophilic side chains are on the surface. The structures are also stabilized by a multitude of hydrogen bonds and some ionic interactions. For the beginning student, the very complex tertiary structures of globular proteins some much larger than myoglobin are best approached by focusing on common structural patterns, recurring in different and often unrelated proteins. The three-dimensional structure of a typical globular protein can be considered an assemblage of polypeptide segments in the alpha helix and beta conformations, linked by connecting segments. The structure can then be defined by how these segments stack on one another, and how the segments that connect them are arranged. To understand a complete three-dimensional structure, we need to analyze its folding patterns. We begin by defining two important terms that describe protein structural patterns or elements in a polypeptide chain and then turn to the folding rules. The first term is motif, also called a fold or, more rarely, supersecondary structure. A motif or fold is a recognizable folding pattern involving two or more elements of secondary structure and the connections between them. A motif can be very simple, such as two elements of secondary structure folded against each other, and represent only a small part of a protein. An example is a beta-alpha-beta loop, fig, 4-18a. A motif can also be a very elaborate structure involving scores of protein segments folded together, such as the beta-barrel, fig, 4-18b. In some cases, a single large motif may comprise the entire protein. The terms motif and fold are often used interchangeably although fold is applied more commonly to somewhat more complex folding patterns. The terms encompass any advantageous folding pattern and are useful for describing such patterns. The segment defined as a motif or fold may or may not be independently stable. We have already encountered a well-studied motif, the coiled coil of alpha-keratin, which is also found in some other proteins. The distinctive arrangement of eight alpha helices in myoglobin is replicated in all globins and is called the globin fold. 
Note that a motif is not a hierarchical structural element falling between secondary and tertiary structure. It is simply a folding pattern. The synonymous term supersecondary structure is thus somewhat misleading because it suggests hierarchy. Box 4 to 5 methods methods for determining the three dimensional structure of a protein. Figure 1 steps in determining the structure of sperm whale myoglobin by X ray crystallography. A. X ray diffraction patterns are generated from a crystal of the protein. B. Data extracted from the diffraction patterns are used to calculate a three dimensional electron density map. The electron density of only part of the structure, the heme, is shown here. C. Regions of greatest electron density reveal the location of atomic nuclei and this information is used to piece together the final structure. Here, the heme structure is modeled into its electron density map. D, the completed structure of sperm whale myoglobin, including the heme. Sources, A, B, C, courtesy of George N. Phillips, Jr., University of Wisconsin, Madison, Department of Biochemistry. D, P, D, B, I, D, 2, M, B, W, E, A, Brucker, E, T, A, L, J. Biol. Chemistry 271 colon 25 comma 419, 1996. X-ray diffraction. The spacing of atoms in a crystal lattice can be determined by measuring the locations and intensities of spots produced on photographic film by a beam of X-rays of given wavelength after the beam has been diffracted by the electrons of the atoms. For example, X-ray analysis of sodium chloride crystals shows that Na plus and Cl ions are arranged in a simple cubic lattice. The spacing of the different kinds of atoms in complex organic molecules, even very large ones such as proteins, can also be analyzed by X-ray diffraction methods. However, the technique for analyzing crystals of complex molecules is far more laborious than for simple salt crystals. When the repeating pattern of the crystal is a molecule as large as, say, a protein, the numerous atoms in the molecule yield thousands of diffraction spots that must be analyzed by computer. Consider how images are generated in a light microscope. Light from a point source is focused on an object. The object scatters the light waves, and these scattered waves are recombined by a series of lenses to generate an enlarged image of the object. The smallest object whose structure can be determined by such a system that is, the resolving power of the microscope is determined by the wavelength of the light, in this case visible light, with wavelengths in the range of 400 to 700 nanometers. Objects smaller than half the wavelength of the incident light cannot be resolved. To resolve objects as small as proteins we must use X-rays, with wavelengths in the range of 0.7 to 1.5 a, 0.07 to 0.15 nanometers. However, there are no lenses that can recombine X-rays to form an image, instead, the pattern of diffracted X-rays is collected directly and an image is reconstructed by mathematical techniques. The amount of information obtained from X-ray crystallography depends on the degree of structural order in the sample. Some important Structural parameters were obtained from early studies of the diffraction patterns of the fibrous proteins arranged in regular arrays in hair and wool. However, the orderly bundles formed by fibrous proteins are not crystals the molecules are aligned side by side, but not all are oriented in the same direction. More detailed three-dimensional structural information about proteins requires a highly ordered protein crystal. The structures of many proteins are not yet known, simply because they have proved difficult to crystallize. Practitioners have compared making protein crystals to holding together a stack of bowling balls with cellophane tape. Operationally, there are several steps in X-ray structural analysis, FIG. 1. A crystal is placed in an X-ray beam between the X-ray source and a detector, and a regular array of spots, called reflections, is generated. The spots are created by the diffracted X-ray beam, and each atom in A. Molecule makes a contribution to each spot. An electron density map of The protein is reconstructed from the overall diffraction pattern of spots by a mathematical technique called a Fourier transform. In effect, the computer acts as a computational lens. A model for the structure is then built that is consistent with the electron density map. 
John Kendrew found that the X-ray diffraction pattern of crystalline myoglobin, isolated from muscles of the sperm whale, is highly complex, with nearly 25,000 reflections. Computer analysis of these reflections took place in stages. The resolution improved at each stage until, in 1959, the positions of virtually all the non-hydrogen atoms in the protein had been determined. The amino acid sequence of the protein, obtained by chemical analysis, was consistent with the molecular model. The structures of thousands of proteins, many of them much more complex than myoglobin, have since been determined to a similar level of resolution. The physical environment in a crystal, of course, is not identical to that in solution or in a living cell. A crystal imposes a space and time average on the structure deduced from its analysis, and X-ray diffraction studies provide little information about molecular motion within the protein. In principle, the conformation of proteins in a crystal could also be affected by non-physiological factors such as incidental protein-protein contacts within the crystal. However, when structures derived from the analysis of crystals are compared with structural information obtained by other means, such as NMR, as described below, the crystal-derived structure almost always represents a functional conformation of the protein. X-ray crystallography can be applied successfully to proteins too large to be structurally analyzed by NMR. Nuclear Magnetic Resonance An advantage of nuclear magnetic resonance NMR, studies is that they are carried out on macromolecules in solution, whereas X-ray crystallography is limited to molecules that can be crystallized. NMR can also illuminate the dynamic side of protein structure, including conformational changes, protein folding, and interactions with other molecules. NMR is a manifestation of nuclear spin angular momentum, a quantum mechanical property of atomic nuclei. Only certain atoms, including 1H, 13C, 15N, 19F, and 31P, have the kind of nuclear spin that gives rise to an NMR signal. Nuclear spin generates a magnetic dipole. When a strong, static magnetic field is applied to a solution containing a single type of macromolecule, the magnetic dipoles are aligned in the field in one of two orientations, parallel, low energy, or antiparallel, high energy. A short, 10 μs, pulse of electromagnetic energy of suitable frequency the resonant frequency, which is in the radio frequency range, is applied at right angles to the nuclei aligned in the magnetic field. Some energy is absorbed as nuclei switch to the high energy state, and the absorption spectrum that results contains information about the identity of the nuclei and their immediate chemical environment. The data from many such experiments on a sample are averaged, increasing the signal-to-noise ratio, and an NMR spectrum such as that in Figure 2 is generated. 1H is particularly important in NMR experiments because of its high sensitivity and natural abundance. For macromolecules, 1H NMR spectra can become quite complicated. Even a small protein has hundreds of 1H atoms, typically resulting in a one-dimensional NMR spectrum too complex for analysis. Structural analysis of proteins became possible with the advent of two-dimensional NMR techniques, FIG, 3. These methods allow measurement of distance-dependent coupling of nuclear spins in nearby atoms through space, the nuclear overhauser effect, NOE, in a method dubbed NOESY, or the coupling of nuclear spins in atoms connected by covalent bonds, total correlation spectroscopy, or TOXI. Figure 2 one dim Translating a two-dimensional NMR spectrum into a complete three-dimensional structure can be a laborious process. The NOE signals provide some information about the distances between individual atoms, but for these distance constraints to be useful, the atoms giving rise to each signal must be identified. Complementary TOXI experiments can help identify which NOE signals reflect atoms that are linked by covalent bonds. Certain patterns of NOE signals have been associated with secondary structures such as alpha helices. Genetic Engineering, Chapter 9 can be used to prepare proteins that contain the rare isotopes 13C or 15N. The new NMR signals produced by these atoms, and the coupling with 1H signals resulting from these substitutions, help in the assignment of individual 1H NOE signals. 
The process is also aided by a knowledge of the amino acid sequence of the polypeptide. To generate a three-dimensional structure, researchers feed the distance constraints into a computer along with known geometric constraints such as chirality, van der Waals radii and bond lengths and angles. The computer generates a family of closely related structures that represent the range of conformations consistent with the NOE distance. Constraints, Fig, 3C. The uncertainty in structures generated by NMR is in. Part a reflection of the molecular vibrations, known as breathing, within a protein structure and solution, discussed in more detail in Chapter 5. Normal experimental uncertainty can also play a role. Figure 3 use Protein structures determined by both X-ray crystallography and NMR generally agree well. In some cases, the precise locations of particular amino acid side chains on the protein exterior are different, often because of effects related to the packing of adjacent protein molecules in a crystal. The two techniques together are at the heart of the rapid increase in the availability of structural information about the macromolecules of living cells. Figure 4 to 18 motifs. A. A simple motif. The second term for describing structural patterns is domain. A domain, as defined by Jane Richardson in 1981, is a part of a polypeptide chain that is independently stable or could undergo movements as a single entity with respect to the entire protein. Polypeptides with more than a few hundred amino acid residues often fold into two or more domains, sometimes with different functions. In many cases, a domain from a large protein will retain its native three-dimensional structure even when separated, for example, by proteolytic cleavage from the remainder of the polypeptide chain. In a protein with multiple domains, each domain may appear as a distinct globular lobe, fig, 4 to 19. More commonly, extensive contacts between domains make individual domains hard to discern. Different domains often have distinct functions, such as the binding of small molecules or interaction with other proteins. Small proteins usually have only one domain, the domain is the protein. Figure 4 to 19 Structural do Folding of polypeptides is subject to an array of physical and chemical constraints, and several rules have emerged from studies of common protein folding patterns. 1. The hydrophobic effect makes a large contribution to the stability of protein structures. Burial of hydrophobic amino acid are groups, so as to exclude water requires at least two layers of secondary structure. Simple motifs such as the beta-alpha-beta loop, fig, 4-18a, create two such layers. 2. Where they occur together in a protein, alpha helices and beta sheets generally are found in different structural layers. This is because the backbone of a polypeptide segment in the beta conformation, fig, 4 to 6, cannot readily hydrogen bond to an alpha helix that is adjacent to it. 3. Segments adjacent to each other in the amino acid sequence are usually stacked adjacent to each other in the folded structure. Distant segments of a polypeptide may come together in the tertiary structure, but this is not the norm. For it, the beta conformation is most stable when the individual segments are twisted slightly in a right-handed sense. This influences both the arrangement of beta sheets derived from the twisted segments and the path of the polypeptide connections between them. Two parallel beta strands, for example, must be connected by a crossover strand, fig. For dash 20A, in principle, this crossover could have a right or left-handed conformation, but in proteins it is almost always right-handed. Right-handed connections tend to be shorter than left-handed connections and tend to bend through smaller angles, making them easier to form. The twisting of beta sheets also leads to a characteristic twisting of the structure formed by many such segments together, as seen in the beta barrel, fig, 4-18b, and twisted beta sheet, fig, 4-20c, which form the core of many larger structures. Following these rules, complex motifs can be built up from simple ones. For example, a series of beta-alpha-beta -beta loops arranged so that the beta strands form a barrel creates a particularly stable and common motif, the alpha-slash-beta barrel fig, 4 to 21. In this structure, each parallel beta segment is attached to its neighbor by an alpha-helical segment. All connections are right-handed. 
The alpha-slash-beta barrel is found in many enzymes, often with a binding site, for a cofactor or substrate, in the form of a pocket near one end of the barrel. Note that domains with similar folding patterns are said to have the same motif, even though they're constituent. Alpha helices and beta sheets may differ in length. Figure 4 to 20 stable folding patterns in proteins. A. Connections. Some proteins or protein segments are intrinsically disordered. In spite of decades of progress in the understanding of protein structure, many proteins cannot be crystallized, making it difficult to determine their three dimensional structure by methods now considered classical. See Box 4 5. Even where crystallization succeeds, parts of the protein are often so disordered within the crystal that the determined structure does not include those parts. Sometimes, this is due to subtle features of the structure that render crystallization difficult. However, the reason can be more straightforward. Some proteins, or protein segments lack an ordered structure and solution. Figure 4 to 21 constructs. The concept that some proteins function in the absence of a definable three-dimensional structure comes from reassessment of data from many different proteins. As many as a third of all human proteins may be unstructured or have significant unstructured segments. All organisms have some proteins that fall into this category. Intrinsically disordered proteins have properties that are distinct from those of classical, structured proteins. They lack a hydrophobic core and instead are characterized by high densities of charged amino acid residues such as lys, arg, and glo. Pro residues are also prominent, as they tend to disrupt ordered structures. Structural disorder and high charge density can facilitate the function of some proteins as spacers, insulators, or linkers in larger structures. Other disordered proteins are scavengers, binding up ions in small molecules in solution and serving as reservoirs or garbage dumps. However, many intrinsically disordered proteins are at the heart of important protein interaction networks. The lack of an ordered structure can facilitate a kind of functional promiscuity, allowing one protein to interact with multiple partners. Some intrinsically disordered proteins act to inhibit the action of other proteins by an unusual mechanism wrapping around their protein targets. One disordered protein may have several or even dozens of protein partners. The structural disorder allows the inhibitor protein to wrap around the multiple targets in different ways. The intrinsically disordered protein P27 plays a key role in controlling mammalian cell division. This protein lacks definable structure and solution. It wraps around and thus inhibits the action of Several enzymes called protein kinases, see chapter 6, that facilitate cell division. The flexible structure of P27 allows it to accommodate itself to its different target proteins. Human tumor cells, which are simply cells that have lost the capacity to control cell division normally, generally have reduced levels of P27. The lower the levels of P27, the poorer the prognosis for the cancer patient. Similarly, intrinsically disordered proteins are often present as hubs or scaffolds at the center of protein networks that constitute signaling pathways, see Fig. 12 to 26. These proteins, or parts of them, may interact with many different binding partners. They often take on an ordered structure when they interact with other proteins, but the structure they assume may vary with different binding partners. The mammalian protein P53 is also critical in the control of cell division. It contains both structured and unstructured segments, and the different segments interact with dozens of other proteins. An unstructured region of P53 at the carboxyl terminus interacts with at least four different binding partners and assumes a different structure in each of the complexes, Fig. 4-22. Protein motifs are the basis for protein structural classification. More than 100,000 protein structures are now archived in the Protein Data Bank, PDB. An enormous amount of information about protein structural principles, protein function, and protein evolution is buried in these data. Fortunately, other databases organize this information and make it more readily accessible. In the Structural Classification of Proteins Database, or SCOP2, 
http colon slash slash scop 2.mrc dash lmb dot cam dot ac dot uk all of the protein information in the PDB can be searched within four different categories, 1. Protein relationships, 2. Structural classes, 3. Protein types, and 4. Evolutionary events. The first category provides several options, proteins can be searched with respect to their structural features, evolutionary relationships, or other, the latter an attempt to define common motifs and subfolds. The second option organizes all PDB structures according to their secondary structural elements, all alpha, all beta, alpha slash beta, with alpha and beta segments interspersed or alternating, and alpha plus beta, with alpha and beta regions somewhat segregated. The third category organizes protein structures by protein type, such as soluble, globular, membrane, fibrous, and intrinsically unstructured proteins. The final category traces structural rearrangements and unusual features of proteins that are evolutionarily related. Figure 4 to 23 presents examples of protein motifs taken from SCOP2 to illustrate the potential of searching within each category. The figure also introduces another way to represent elements of secondary structure and the relationships among segments of secondary structure in a protein the topology diagram. Figure 4 to 22 binding of the intrinsically disordered carboxyl terminus of P53 protein to its binding partners. A. The P53 protein is made up of several different segments. O. Figure 4 to 23 organization of the number of folding patterns is not infinite. Among the more than 80,000 distinct protein structures archived in the PDB, only about 1,200 different folds or motifs are represented. Given the many years of progress in structural biology, new motifs are now only rarely discovered. Many examples of recurring domain or motif structures are available, and these reveal that protein tertiary structure is more reliably conserved than amino acid sequence. The comparison of protein structures can thus provide much information about evolution. Proteins with significant similarity in primary structure and or with similar tertiary structure and function are said to be in the same protein family. The protein structures in the PDB belong to about 4,000 different protein families. A strong evolutionary relationship is usually evident within a protein family. For example, the globin family has many different proteins with both structural and sequence similarities to myoglobin as seen in the proteins used as examples in box 4 to 5 and in chapter 5. Two or more families that have little similarity in amino acid sequence, but make use of the same major structural motif and have functional similarities are grouped into superfamilies, an evolutionary relationship among families in. A superfamily is considered probable, even though time and functional distinctions that is, different adaptive pressures may have erased many of the telltale sequence relationships. A protein family may be widespread in all three domains of cellular life, the bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, suggesting an ancient origin. Many proteins involved in intermediary metabolism and the metabolism of nucleic acids and proteins fall into this category. Other families may be present in only a small group of organisms, indicating that the structure arose more recently. Tracing the natural history of structural motifs through the use of structural classifications in databases such as SCOP2 provides a powerful complement to sequence analyses in tracing evolutionary relationships. The SCOP2 database is curated manually, with the objective of placing proteins in the correct evolutionary framework based on conserved structural features. Structural motifs become especially important in defining protein families and superfamilies. Improved protein classification and comparison systems lead inevitably to the elucidation of new functional relationships. Given the central role of proteins in living systems, these structural comparisons can help illuminate every aspect of biochemistry, from the evolution of individual proteins to the evolutionary history of complete metabolic pathways. Protein quaternary structures range from simple dimers to large complexes. Many proteins have multiple polypeptide subunits, from two to hundreds. The association of polypeptide chains can serve a variety of functions. 
Many multi-subunit proteins have regulatory roles, the binding of small molecules may affect the interaction between subunits, causing large changes in the protein's activity in response to small changes in the concentration of substrate or regulatory molecules, Chapter 6. In other cases, separate subunits take on separate but related functions, such as catalysis and regulation. Some associations, such as the fibrous proteins considered earlier in this chapter and the coat proteins of viruses, serve primarily structural roles. Some very large protein assemblies are the site of complex, multi-step reactions. For example, each ribosome, the site of protein synthesis, incorporates dozens of protein subunits along with RNA molecules. A multi-subunit protein is also referred to as a multimer. A multimer with just a few subunits is often called an oligomer. If a multimer has non-identical subunits, the overall structure of the protein can be asymmetric and quite complicated. However, most multimers have identical subunits or repeating groups of non-identical subunits, usually in symmetric arrangements. As noted in Chapter 3, the repeating structural unit in such a multimeric protein, whether a single subunit or a group of subunits, is called a protomer. The first oligomeric protein to have its three-dimensional structure determined was hemoglobin, Mr. 64500, which contains four polypeptide chains and four heme prosthetic groups, in which the iron atoms are in the ferrous, Fe2+, state, Fig, 4 to 17. The protein portion, the globin, consists of two alpha chains, 141 residues each, and two beta chains, 146 residues each. Note that in this case, alpha and beta do not refer to secondary structures. In a practice that can be confusing to the beginning student, the Greek letters alpha and beta and gamma, delta, and others are often used to distinguish two different kinds of subunits within a multi-subunit protein, regardless of what kinds of secondary structure may predominate in the subunits. Because hemoglobin is four times as large as myoglobin, much more time and effort were required to solve its three-dimensional structure by X-ray analysis, finally achieved by Max Peretz, John Kendrew, and their colleagues in 1959. The subunits of hemoglobin are arranged in symmetric pairs, Fig. 4 to 24, each pair having one alpha and one beta subunit. Hemoglobin can therefore be described either as a tetramer or as a dimer of alpha-beta protomers. The role these distinct subunits play in hemoglobin function is discussed extensively in Chapter 5. Max Peretz, Figure 4 to Summary 4.3 Protein Tertiary and Quaternary Structures Tertiary structure is the complete three-dimensional structure of a polypeptide chain. Many proteins fall into one of two general classes of proteins based on tertiary structure, fibrous and globular. Fibrous proteins, which serve mainly structural roles, have simple repeating elements of secondary structure. Globular proteins have more complicated tertiary structures, often containing several types of secondary structure in the same polypeptide chain. The first globular protein structure to be determined, by X-ray diffraction methods, was that of myoglobin. The complex structures of globular proteins can be analyzed by examining folding patterns called motifs, also called folds or supersecondary structures. The many thousands of known protein structures are generally assembled from a repertoire of only a few hundred motifs. Domains are regions of a polypeptide chain that can fold stably and independently. Some proteins or protein segments are intrinsically disordered, lacking definable three-dimensional structure. These proteins have distinctive amino acid compositions that allow a more flexible structure. Some of these disordered proteins function as structural components or scavengers, others can interact with many different protein partners, serving as versatile inhibitors or as central components of protein interaction networks. Quaternary structure results from interactions between the subunits of multi-subunit, multimeric, proteins or large protein assemblies. Some multimeric proteins have a repeated unit consisting of a single subunit or a group of subunits, each unit called a protomer. Four point